I wasn't sure if I'd have time for another today, but it turns out that I'm slightly ahead on paperwork, updating my ship's radio license and all that faff, so aside from an excuse to showcase this grumpy-looking sky atop Alan's soon-to-be-vacated home on land, a quick update. Some of this footage will end up getting buried and out of context otherwise. The mast, although up, was only being held in place temporarily by the main steel brace to the starboard side and two ropes. I needed to measure the exact lengths for custom-made stainless steel wire rope stays to be made up, and then of course I needed to sort out the anchors. The sternward one can be a simple eye plate, and I slightly enlarged the bolt hole so I could use 6mm bolts. On the other side of the fiberglass shell, I thought for the sake of variety I'd make a plate, instead of using heavy-duty large area washers. Because why not? Steel drilled using the eye plate as a template later, I just had to hope that I could drill the hole in the shell perfectly straight, otherwise the holes wouldn't line up once separated by a few millimetres of fibreglass shell. Time for relentless quality and precision once more. The next step was to leap up top and attach the two ends of my new stays. These, in the same way that I did for the ones in the bow end railing episode, I sized up so that the eventual locked and tension position would be in the middle of the turnbuckle's thread. And behold, my first and luckily only issue of the day, any dramatic tension for later in the video thereby demolished. The jaw of the stays terminal was just half a millimetre or so too narrow for the eye, and steel isn't too easy to compress using the mere force of a man's hand, so out came the grinder. A minor shaving here and a little more there, and a perfect fit. You can all breathe again. I tightened the turnbuckle until my spirit level promised me the mast was vertical, and then did up the two nuts. Does anyone know if I need to do anything more to lock those nuts in place, or do the pair of them act as a lock against loosening? This is what the top looks like, very smart. And on the other side, there's no need for an eye plate since the stay attaches to the rail, using a thread I had built into the end of the wire rope. The wire ropes are PVC wrapped, because it can do no harm, and the people at GS Products are good at upselling. A couple of shorter ones to stop the spar wobbling around all over the place in the wind, and we have success, but not completion. Eagle-eyed viewers will notice the bottom rivet isn't locked in yet on this eye plate. That's because it's awaiting this. A radar reflector. The one Alan came with was ancient, enormous, and designed more for emergency use from life rafts. I didn't like where the pre-drilled holes were, so made my own, naturally. On it goes, in the only place I could find that's not going to get in the way, yet still do its job, allowing people to see us on their screens. Now to some of the associated wiring just below the driving console. Two critical items of equipment, the VHF and AIS, get their own high quality 24 to 12 volt fuse regulator, and then this little distribution box so some electricity can head to each unit. Then up goes the dual battery charger that's designed to work with Allen's wind turbine. I'm thinking of having this as a swappable charger, with two plugs that can head to whichever batteries are in need. House batteries, the crank battery, portable ones, whichever. I also need a little box to contain some buttons and switches, a little regulator and a fuse or two. So I turn to my new favourite bit, the step drill, and make some holes. Through one goes a momentary on-off button, and that will allow me to sound Alan's horn at moments of greater or lesser peril. Also, a pair of more normal lever switches that we can use to control the white mast light and the red-green bicolour light up at the bow. You see, this is how they work bringing you accurate and profound footage since 2020. Even sharper viewers will have noticed the wing controller has already shifted left, as this is where the switch box is going to end up, within reach of the helm and those standing around below, yet not able to be easily tripped by accident. Inside I just had to connect up all the various wires that are currently draping from the deckhead where they pass through and into the mast base. I needed to make a decision about voltage regulation. It's going to be the horn and then two sets of lights, so the nav light up on the mast and then the port and starboard lights over at the bow. Only one of them is going to be at 12 volts. And so for that reason, because it's only the horn, uh, the two lights are 24 volts, because it's only the horn, I'm not going to go for an extremely elaborate, um, uh, either isolated or sort of high, uh, high end Victron unit. I'm just going to go for a basic 24 to 12 volt converter here. The other two will just be fused just in case there's any shorting or anything that uh, causes um, any disaster. But really, I think all that we need for the horn is, is one of these. In the past, I've used tons of these little sealed voltage converters for non critical jobs. And although they don't deal with more than a few amps, I've never had any of them fail on me. 
Also, since I'm relying pretty heavily on Wago connectors, which I like as they are small, adaptable and don't need ferruled wire ends, I thought I'd use them on the converter before mounting it properly into the junction box. It means that if there are problems with any of the components, they can be swapped out without cutting, soldering or recrimping. Not suitable for all applications, but good here. Right, I'll finish and close all this up with a view showing that, as of the moment this was filmed, the mask stay hasn't failed. And also, a massive cheers to the dozens of you who responded to Alan's call for diesel. I'll try and update the website to let you know where we stand as to covering our fuel and overnight berthing expenses for this summer. A double cheers. Bye.